So I'm going to ask you to join me in Luke chapter 3. Luke 3. I'm so thankful that Brother Trevor uh, thought about me, called, uh, asked if I would fill in this morning. He knew that um, I couldn't do both services because of my church obligations, but uh, this does work out great for us. It's hard, it's hard for me to picture that three years have just went by uh, since the last time I've had an opportunity to be in a service uh, with you guys. Um, of course, uh, at my church, we are working our way through the Gospel of Luke, and Trevor told me just to, to pick up where whatever I'm talking about at our church, whatever our messages have been on, whatever I'm going to preach about this morning, just to bring it to you. So you're, you're going to have an opportunity to join my church this morning in the study of God's Word. We're in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 today. We, we basically just go verse by verse through uh, books of the Bible uh, when I preach, and uh, so all of my folks know what we're going to be preaching about the next week. Wherever we end, that's where we pick it up. Very familiar passage uh, today. Uh, we are going to look at the baptism of our Lord today. Uh, so just a couple of verses, like Scotty said, um, just to kind of bring us back so we'll all be on the same uh, footing this morning. Uh, Luke has been laying the groundwork for this very moment. Uh, we have spent months at our church getting to, to this point. In chapter 3, John the Baptist has been front and center. He's been on the stage uh, the entire time. Uh, the first uh, 20 verses of this chapter have all been about uh, John the Baptist and his ministry and uh, what he's actually doing. Of course, uh, John, an uh, incredible, incredible man of God, uh, Jesus actually says of John that he's the greatest man ever born of human parents up to this point. John was, um, he was the last Old Testament prophet and the greatest Old Testament prophet because he specifically had the unique job of pointing out Jesus to the world. Obviously, his, his first um, responsibility was to prepare the hearts of the people. So he went around and he preached in the wilderness, a, a, a bapti he preached a repentance and then a baptism for that repentance. Um, of course, John, his story began earlier in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, he was a miraculous child. He was born under miraculous circumstances. His parents, uh, two elderly uh, people, had never had children, and uh, God sent an angel uh, to his father and told him of this upcoming conception and that this child would be called John and he would be uh, preparing the people for the coming of the Messiah. And that's today what we find is the great event where his ministry basically uh, changes, where John's ministry kind of goes not, it's not in the forefront anymore, but after this moment, Jesus will be on the, the center stage. This actually signals the beginning of the ministry of our Lord uh, Jesus. So today I'm going to ask if you would to look with me. Uh, we're going to look at these two verses together and uh, just pray that, uh, that God would reveal himself to you as we, we look at these. So let's look at verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Wonderful, beautiful verses, very familiar to us. Um, with the simple statement there, in verse 21 where it says Jesus was also baptized, um, this ministry of our Lord begins. The focus on these verses um, is what is going on at the baptism. Jesus was praying, heaven was opened, the Holy Spirit came down, and the Father's voice came out of heaven. Um, what we have here this morning is the divine confirmation of Jesus as the Messiah. He is the one that 
uh, we have been waiting on. He's the one that the Jews have been waiting on. He is the anointed Savior, the Son of God, the Messiah. He is the one that everything in the Old Testament had been pointing to. He's the one who was promised by the angel Gabriel when he came to Mary and, and said that she would give a child who would be the son of the Most High. Here he is. He is the one who is affirmed by the angels when they said to the shepherds, Glory to God in the highest, for today was born a Savior, Christ the Lord. He is here under the spotlight. Now, when Jesus comes to be baptized, he's, he's 30 years old. We, we know that from the scriptures. And for his entire life, he's basically lived in obscurity. He had no ministry up to this point. Uh, he had no public profile. Uh, there was uh, nothing about him that made him any different than anybody else physically. Uh, he didn't have a halo around his head. Um, there was no light coming out of him. He was just a carpenter up to this point. But now it's time for his ministry to begin. It's time for him to start his life's work. It's time for him to fulfill what he came to earth for. So he goes down to the Jordan River where John is baptizing. And by the way, John baptized many, many people. And as a matter of fact, uh, Jesus goes down into the water just like everyone else. There's nothing really to signal him out until God points him out, until God identifies him. So when Jesus is baptized and, and all of heaven is opened in these verses, uh, it's because this isn't just another baptism. This is the launch of the ministry of God's Son, the Savior of the world. What John is focusing on here in these two verses that we just read about is the voice that comes out of heaven, especially where the statement there is from the Father that this is my, my Son in whom I am well pleased. Very brief account of the baptism of the Lord here in Luke. Mark writes about this baptism and gives many more details uh, surrounding it, and so does John. So the Gospels deal uh, completely with this. They weave different things together, and, and if we wanted to get a fuller understanding of the baptism, we'd simply uh, look at, at those accounts. One uh, footnote that I really want us to think about this morning as we get ready to look at this text together is that in these two verses we have the Trinity, one of the greatest passages in the New Testament to point out the Trinity. You know, there's a lot of folks that deny the Trinity that say that the Bible doesn't teach that, um, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but that there's only one God. Um, and, of course, those people would be totally unbiblical because the Bible completely teaches in the Trinity. Um, and today, that's really what, what we're going to use as our, our outline, really. We're going to look at what the Trinity, uh, how the Trinity is involved in this baptism. Let's start with the Son. You know, we usually start with the Father. We're going to end with the Father today. Uh, let's begin with the Son because that's how they appear in, in this passage, uh, in this order. Look over at verse 21 again. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open. Now, where the, the passage here says that all the people, that means the crowds, right? This doesn't mean that every single person in Israel had come out to be baptized. But back in verse 7 of this chapter, we read that there were multitudes coming out. There are many people that are coming. And we also learn this, that God brings these people out to the wilderness where John is preaching. John is very popular. Large, large crowds were coming day after day. Uh, his, his ministry went on for months and months. John's baptism, uh, again, was a baptism of repentance. These people were coming out acknowledging their need to repent, acknowledging that they are outside of the relationship with God that they should be in, and it's because of their sin. 
They recognize their sin, and as an outward show of their turning, of their heart changing, uh, they're baptized to show that this has happened in their life. Just as we know, baptism doesn't save you, but it's an outward show that you have been saved, right? And that's what these people are coming to do. And so John has been preaching, if you want to be ready for the Messiah, he's on his way that you need to confess your sins and then to show that that it has really had an effect in your life, uh, repent of your sins and then be baptized. It's an outward symbol of what has happened on the inside. And here where the word all is used in, in verse 21, it refers to all who were baptized. So here at the height of John's ministry, people are coming day after day and here comes Jesus upon the scene. Over um, in Matthew chapter 3, I'm going to read uh, just briefly here in Matthew chapter 3 beginning in verse 14. At, at this very moment that Jesus shows up to be baptized, we read this. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me? God had opened John's eyes. God had, had revealed to John that this is the Messiah. This is the one that you are out here preaching about. God made sure John understood who Jesus was. John basically is saying, I can't baptize you. It's not proper for me to baptize you. This is, a, by the way, a wonderful testimony from John about Jesus. John has been given insight to understand that this is the Messiah, the Son of the Most High who has come to him. He knew that since Jesus was the Son of God, he was everything that God is. He was holy. He was perfect. He was pure. He was sinless. John understood that. John had a really good understanding of the Scriptures. He knew that God was not like us. And he says, I can't baptize you. I can't baptize you. Matter of fact, I need you to baptize me. Jesus, you're sinless is what he's saying. Jesus, you have no reason to be baptized. And so it was impossible in John's mind for this to be happening because his baptism was a baptism of repentance. It was for those who knew that they needed to turn from their sins. It was for those who knew that they fell short of God's glory. And John knows that's not true. When God opened his eyes and he saw Jesus, he knew Jesus didn't have that need that you and me have. It's a great testimony, by the way, that Jesus is God. That's what John is testifying here. And yet, this is why Jesus came. This is why he came. You know, um, if you read the next verse over in Matthew, Chapter 3, in verse 15, it says this, But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. Jesus gives a response for why he is coming to be baptized. You know, people have written all types of things concerning why Jesus was baptized. There have been all types of things. Some suggest that Jesus came to be baptized to please his mother. Now, somehow Mary saw that all of the people who wanted to be made right with God were coming down to John uh, there in uh, Judea, and they were being baptized. And, of course, Jesus being a special child, Jesus having a ministry that was upcoming, uh, Mary wanted Jesus to go do this so that uh, he could be connected to the people, so that he could be associated. So that, so basically Jesus gave in to what his mother wanted. That's really foolish, by the way. Uh, Mary didn't have any, um, she didn't have any, any thought or input on why Jesus is coming down uh, to be baptized. There's another false view that Jesus was a sinner. Y'all know there's people that actually teach that. That up to this point, Jesus was just like you and me. That he was a sinner. 
and that God is going to erase his sin, and at the moment of his baptism, uh, God will indwell him. There are some people that, that seriously call themselves Christian, call themselves a church, and they teach that Jesus was a sinner and that he had to be made right with God. But when he was made right with God, he never sinned again. That God indwelled him the moment he was baptized. And that's what's going on here with the Holy Spirit coming down and, and the voice coming out of heaven. God's announcing to Jesus that now you are my son. We have a, a, a word that we use for uh, describing people that hold to those types of views. We call them heretics. It's unbiblical. That's not Christian, by the way. It's blasphemy, actually, is what it is. Jesus gives us the reason he's baptized. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, what we just read. What we just read. And in that, he says, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. This was an act of righteousness that came from Christ. Over in, uh, in John's gospel, this is the last time I'll jump somewhere else, but in John chapter 1, verse 30, um, 32 and 33, this is another uh, layer of the baptism story. You could you know, lay this on top of what we're already talking about, and it gives us more information. It helps us to see some other things here. We read in verse 32, And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven, like a dove, and it remained upon him. And in verse 33, he says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remain on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I love verse 34. And I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. John says, God told me this. God showed me this. God showed him that when the Holy Spirit comes down and remains on that one, that's the Messiah. That's the one that you're preaching about. God had called people to be baptized, by the way. God had called people to be baptized throughout Israel. So Jesus did this not because he had to to be forgiven of his sins, because he didn't have any sins, right? He did it so he would live a life of perfect obedience to God. He did it so that he would live a life of perfect righteousness. He never did what he shouldn't have done, and he always did what he should have done. He never, did I say that right? My brain is like, I don't know if you said that right, Eddie. He never did what he shouldn't have done, and he always did what he should have done. I think that, that came out right. Because he's obedient to God. He's perfect. He's obedient to God's word. By the way, did you know Jesus took the Passover? Jesus took the Passover. And when you stop to think about it, why did he take the Passover? Because isn't that Passover thing all about we need to be covered, our sins need to be covered? Right? I need to be forgiven. Right? You know, they put the blood on the doorpost in the Old Testament. And ever since that, you know, and they took the lamb into their body. And they did it because they were recognizing they needed a deliverer. They needed to be saved. They needed to be made right with God. They needed to be protected from the wrath of God because of their sins. Why did Jesus take it? He did it because God commanded his people to do it. That's why he did it. Y'all, he is the Passover, right? He is the Passover lamb. But he did the Passover even the night before he was arrested, right? He did the Passover one last time with his disciples. It wasn't because he was unrighteous. It was because he was righteous. Some people um, say that his baptism was like a rite of passage, like this... Um, open the door to his ministry. Well, in, in some ways, I mean, it is a beginning of his ministry, but that's, that's not why he's baptized, per se. Some say that uh, he was really affirming the ministry of John. He was really uh, 
that God is, is showing that John's ministry was a real ministry. Well, it was a real ministry, but that, again, that's not why Jesus is being baptized because he doesn't have to be baptized for his own uh, needs. He's doing it because God commanded him to be baptized uh, like everybody else. Some say he's acting like a sinner in our place. You know, just as you and I, we couldn't be baptized in John's um, baptism of repentance. You and I can't do that, but Jesus did that for us. The bottom line, the truth is um, it was because he was being obedient to God. The bottom line is John was reluctant because he knew what his baptism meant. His baptism was to fulfill all righteousness, to do what God required to be done. You know, um, there's, there's a truth, I think, that a lot of times in our churches today, we, we've kind of skipped over. We, we don't see it as, as, as important, I guess, as, as maybe long ago they used to preach about this. But there's a great exchange that takes place when it comes to us and Christ. We give Christ our sins, right? He, he takes our sins from us, but that's not where he leaves us. He not only erases our sins, but he does something else. There's an exchange. You and I receive something from God. And it's not, it's not just salvation. We say that, but it's more than just salvation. We receive from God the righteousness of Christ. When you get saved, guys, you know that not only does God remove your sins, but he gives you something that you, you could never earn or you could never hold on to, but it's put inside of you. It covers you, and that is the perfect life of Christ. He gets your sin, you get his perfect life. When God looks at you, he sees his son. He sees the obedience of his son. And you and I know, even after we get saved, we are so not like Jesus. We are so not obedient all the time, right? We fail. We, we fall. It's called imputed righteousness. And that's what we get from Christ. Now back to Luke. Back to Luke. Uh, it's interesting that when Christ is baptized, it, a little phrase that, that we just don't even re we don't even recognize this we just we don't even see this most of the time we just see the big picture Jesus came and he was baptized but we don't see all the, some of the other things notice what it says while he prayed he's praying Jesus is praying while he is going down to be baptized you know he lived in prayer his life was a life of prayer um, what is prayer communication with God right it's, it's open communication with God. That's what prayer is. You talk to God, God speaks to your heart, right? You, you communicate, you verbalize to God. That's what Christ did continually. That's what he always did. That's what he was doing before his baptism. So before he is put in the water, he is in prayer. He lived in open communication with God. His father. By the way, there had never been a break in this communication with his father. There's only one moment in eternal in eternal history, from eternity past through eternity future. There's only one moment when there's a break in this fellowship, this communication. And you all know where that is. It's on the cross. You remember that moment? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was the moment that Christ became the sin bearer. It was the moment that my sin and your sin was placed upon Christ. And God for that moment turns from his son. And there's a severing of that communication. Because he became a sin bearer for me and for you. But apart from that moment. Not a, not, a, not a sliver of time are they alienated. God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit were in perfect communion. So God, the Son here is in perfect communion with his Father. That brings us to uh, 
the second person in the Trinity. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit here. Look at verse 22. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. You know, this doesn't mean that the Lord didn't have the Holy Spirit before this. It's not teaching that this was the moment in time that the Holy Spirit first came to Jesus. Y'all, Jesus is part of the Trinity. He's part of the eternal Godhead. There was never a moment prior to this and uh, that the Holy Spirit wasn't with him. Uh, he's not like an unbeliever coming to faith. He's not like you and me before we knew the Lord. When you and I came to the Lord and you and I were saved, the Holy Spirit came into us, right? He lives in us. He doesn't leave us. But before that, we were children of the devil is what the Bible teaches. We didn't, we didn't belong to God. The, the, the Godhead wasn't upon us. But at our conversion, the Spirit comes and lives in us, right? That's not what's happening here. That's not what's going on in this case. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had always been together. The Spirit descends upon him here for a specific reason. The Spirit was already in and upon him, but there is a visual that is taking, taking place. Uh, over in John chapter 1 and 32 and 33, we're not going to read that, but twice there we are told this very thing that the Spirit descended and remained upon him. This is a testimony connected to his ministry. What Luke is telling us, what the other gospel writers are telling us, is that God is affirming his Son. God is affirming his Son. This is a visual confirmation. John saw it, and I don't think John is the only one who sees it. I think others see something here as well. Uh, by the way, you remember over in the, uh, the Holy Spirit is, an, is not visible, okay, to us. We, we can't see the Holy Spirit. You can feel his work upon your life. You can feel him, his presence in your life. We could see him work events out in others' lives, but you don't see the Holy Spirit, right? But here, there is a visible form that conveys the reality of what's happening. Back in Luke 3, just for a moment, um, let's talk about the Holy Spirit just for a moment. One thing, the Holy Spirit's not a bird, okay? The Holy Spirit is not a morning dove, okay? That we always have that visual of the, of the Holy Spirit as uh, a bird. It, it, as a matter of fact, it doesn't even say that here. It says, uh, as, you, as you look at this, it said descending on, that the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove. And the focus is not that it looked like a dove, but that it descended like a dove. The focus is on the movement, not the actual bird. Like a, like a dove gently descends and, light, and lands on something. Just a peaceful, wonderful bird, right? That's the way the Holy Spirit came down in some visual fashion and landed upon him. Um, that's what we're really talking about. Um, God created some way of seeing the unseeable. That's, that's what's taking place here. You remember over in Acts um, at Pentecost, right, when the Holy Spirit came down upon the believers? And it's, there was a visual thing that happened where there were like tongues of fire that came down and landed upon the people. There was a visual connection to a, a spiritual reality. That, that is the same type of thing that was, that was done here. There is something you can connect to physically and see what is happening. It is God saying, this is the one. This is my son. And then he actually does say, this is my son. Uh, let's look at the, the father here. We looked at the son. We looked at the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the father. Out of the end of our passage here in Luke, you are my beloved son, this voice says, coming out of heaven. Heaven is the abode of God, right? 
it's some other plane somewhere uh, in this created universe. God opened that up, and from that, he spoke these words. So it would have been an audible voice that people heard, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. We got the son coming in his baptism. The spirit comes to anoint and the father gives testimony to his son. Uh, over in uh, John chapter 8 and then also in John chapter 5, uh, Jesus says, uh, my father, the father bears witness of me is what he says. The father bears witness of me. You know, he is the greatest witness of the son. You remember that event, the, the transfiguration, when Christ went up on the mountain with a few of his disciples, and uh, he was transfigured before everybody's eyes. They saw him unlike the normal form that they saw him. You know, when they saw Jesus, normally he looked like a human. He looked like a flesh and blood person. There's totally difference on the inside. He's God in a human body. But what they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration was a human body with God coming out of it. When that light showed up and, and the brightness of Christ, when he changed, it was God coming out of Christ. At that moment, um, there was another voice from heaven. And there it says, And this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. God spoke to the disciples and said, This is the Son of God. This is the Son of God. So the Father gave an open testimony to the Son. And, and that's what's going on here. There's an open, public, verbal testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. That makes Him equal to God, by the way. He is one with God. He's the same in essence. He's the same in nature. Um, he carries the same genetics that the Father has, right? Uh, everything the Father is, that's what Christ is. The Bible even says he is the exact representation of the Father. Uh, one, uh, the disciples once said, show us the Father, speaking to Jesus. That's what we want to see. We want to see the Father. And what did Jesus say? Haven't you been with me all this time? To look at Jesus is to see the Father. If you ever want to know what God the Father is like, read about Jesus. Read about Jesus. Because when you see Jesus and the things he did, the things he said, you are in fact seeing the very nature of God. The Jews got really upset when Jesus was called the Son of God. When Jesus called himself the Son of God, it got him in a lot of trouble. They called him a blasphemer because to say you are the Son of God is making yourself equal with God. Y'all, Jesus did that all the time. People say that Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, those people just never read the Bible because he did that all the time. He said, I am the Son of God. So the Father is saying, yes, you are the Son of God, right? The Holy Spirit is saying, yes, you are the Son of God. He's called, by the way, Son of God about 50 times in the Gospels. The Bible doesn't shy away from this, right? The Bible is very clear. You know, there's a lot of people that say Jesus is the greatest man who ever lived. There's a lot of people uh, from other faiths, whether they're Muslims or wh whatever they might be, they will say Jesus is a great teacher. Great, Jesus is a great prophet, the greatest prophet, the greatest teacher. But he's more than that, y'all. He, he is a great teacher. He is a great prophet. But until you see him as God, you're lost in your sins. He is the Son of God. He's not only a son, but here in Luke, God says he's a beloved son. The beloved son. And so the Father loves the Son with perfect love. There's a supernatural divine love between all the members of the Trinity. You know, a lot of people say, why, why did God create the world? Why did God create um, the universe? And some people say, well, it, he was lonely. 
Man, he's so weak. God's not lonely. God had perfect fellowship with himself for eternity past. He's perfectly content with himself, right? What makes God happy? I'm going to give you a secret. It's not you. You know what makes God happy? Himself. God is pleased with his son. He is pleased with the Holy Spirit. You and I, we are, we bring glory to God because we display the radiance of Christ back to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. That's our purpose, is to show Christ to the world, but also so that Christ is magnified. We bring glory to God when we worship Him. What a testimony this is this morning, y'all. This is more than just... Christ going down into the water, being baptized, and we hit the ground running in Luke. Now we can talk about all the miracles and all those things. Those are wonderful things, but we don't need to pass over the truth of this scripture. This is God in a human body, and God tells us that. The Father tells us that. The Holy Spirit tells us this. The the words of John in the other gospel accounts tell us this reality. It should have been clear. I mean... Um, when you've got a visible representation of the Holy Spirit of God and you've got the voice of God, it should have shook everyone to their core that was there. Um, It should have been burned upon them. It should have launched his ministry uh, with people responding all over and falling at his feet. And the sad truth is um, that's not the way it works out. That's not the way it works out. You know, when Christ went, when he was... um, on the cross, he dies, and he's buried, he raised, he's raised from the dead. That at that moment, there was 120 believers, 120 believers of the countless tens to hundreds of thousands that Christ had ministered to in three years. The gospel had been preached uh, everywhere, the good news that the Messiah had come, and there's 120 believers. The Bible says he came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. There's a sadness about the, the, the Gospels in, in that sense. How can people ignore the truth? And sadly, people still ignore that truth, don't they? By the way, to have the wrong view of Jesus, to say he's just a good man, to say he was a perfect man and he died for us, but that's as far as you go with that, um, is to not result in salvation, right? If God doesn't die for you, you're not getting saved, right? Because all flesh is corrupted. That's what the Bible says. There is none righteous. No, not one. That would include every human that has ever lived on planet Earth. None have been righteous. None were um, able to die for sins. It took something outside of us. It took a perfect man, and the only perfect man was the Son of God who lived in flesh. Here in Luke 3, the Son of God has emerged. That's the beginning of his ministry, and it's all because of him that we have salvation. Amen? He is our salvation. Do you know him? Do you know Christ? I mean, we all know the stories, but I mean, do you know him personally? Have you ever had an encounter with the Son of God? I have learned this in studying God's Word and, and in the reality of uh, people as well, and, and even in my own life, that to know things about Jesus is good, but that doesn't save you, right? Jesus doesn't leave you like you are, too, by the way. If you, if you come to him in, in salvation, he changes you. Has there been a change in your life? Are there differences in your, your life today? I'm going to ask this morning... As we, uh, we bow for a, a word of prayer, do you think about that time when you recognized Christ as God's son and you called upon him to forgive you of your sins? You received him. The Holy Spirit has come and lives inside of you. And, and the Father gives testimony to that reality by your life. You, you live a different life now, and it's because you've met Christ, the son of God. I'm going to ask if you would to bow with me for a word of prayer. As you're bowed, um, 
Just think about that, that time that you came to Christ for salvation. I'm going to pray for us, and, and after I pray, will you continue praying? Will you continue to seek God? And, and listen, if you're a believer this morning, you know Christ is God. You know uh, Christ is the Son of God. You, you know He's the perfect Savior. You've received Him as your Savior. You've turned from your sins. You're, you're a Christian. Hey, are you telling people about Him? Are you living for His glory? You know, as Christians, we can, we can be pretty um, changeable. We, there can be things in our life that need to change. There can be things in our life that need to um, be brought to the light. So will you pray that God would show you the truth about yourself this morning? And whatever He tells you to do, you do it. Father, have your way in our heart this morning. We love you. We give you praise. We uh, do pray this morning as we have thought about these passages of Scripture and we've seen Christ, the Son of God, displayed before us that our hearts would be excited, our hearts would be open to say, that's, that's my Savior, that's my Lord that we're talking about this morning. That's the one I love. That's the one I desire to be closer to. What a testimony that is. Uh, Lord, when that happens to us, it's confirmation that we know you. Father, let that be true about our life. And if there's anybody here today that that's not true about, somebody maybe is sitting here today, they know stories about Jesus, but they've never received him as Savior. May this be the day that you display that Christ is God's Son. Open our hearts, open our minds, help us to turn to you. Father, as Christians are thinking about these things today, would you help us to see that we haven't yet arrived. There's still things about our life that are wayward. There's things that we need to change. There's uh, repentance that needs to happen in our life daily. And today, would you have your way in our heart? We pray this in Christ's name. As you continue to 